let's see. Okay. All right. We are live and underway. So welcome everybody to another session of Hegel and Dialethism. So our talk today is by Alessandro de Cesaris and the talk is Beyond, Con uh, Beyond Contradiction, Speculative Thought and Hermeneutics. So take it away, Alex. Thank you, Greg, and uh, many, many thanks to, to Greg, Elena, and Grant for this beautiful uh, occasion to, to share with you all my, some of my, of my research, but mostly because for this beautiful seminar. I, I'm having a lot of fun, and I've been working, as I told um, to Greg, I, I've been working on uh, other subjects for a long time, and it's really, really, I'm really happy to have the, the chance to, to delve into Hegelian philosophy again together with, uh, with you. So uh, first of all, I am going to do something slightly different from uh, what I had originally planned. Uh, I, I'm uh, basically before, because after hearing the beautiful papers uh, of the last um, few weeks, I've decided to focus on the question of speculative thinking and to try and offer um, a specific reading of the relationship between speculation, dialectics, and the problem of contradiction in Hegel, but maybe not only in Hegel's uh, uh, philosophy. This means that with respect to my original intentions, uh, the question of hermeneutics will be left on the background. I'm sorry about that. I know Elena and Frank are two great, uh, prominent figures in the uh, <laughs> debate on contemporary hermeneutics, but maybe there will be time uh, in another occasion. Uh, what will I do? I will um, try to sketch some fundamental elements of the notion of speculation throughout the uh, history of Western uh, thought. I, of course, I will be very brief. I will uh, um, only, I have only chosen three examples. Uh, after this, I will focus on Hegel's notion of speculation, and I will try to show where, in my opinion, are uh, its specific elements. And finally, I will briefly discuss what has uh, already come up in uh, many, maybe even uh, in most of the papers uh, of this seminar, namely the relation be between the speculative uh, and, uh, and the, the notion of speculative and contradiction. Um, however, I want to uh, say this is the first draft of a, of a project I've been having for some time, uh, but that I've just started working on. So for this reason, um, of course, criticism and all other kinds of remarks are particularly welcome. And precisely because this is a first draft, uh, before going on, I would like to start with what uh, you read there uh, at the point one as, a, as an unscientific uh, introduction. I, I use a Kierkegaardian, uh, I paraphrase Kierkegaard there. In other words, I'd like to start by making explicit uh, my subjective stance on uh, about the topic of this beautiful seminar, my, my uh, gut feeling, if you, if you wish. Uh, what I'm going, uh, if you will, what, what I'm going to say in the next three, four minutes uh, is not meant to be an argument, uh, but rather a reflection of my own precomprehensions and prejudices about uh, the topic. And then after that, maybe uh, I will start saying something more precise about uh, speculation. So first of all, uh, during my education, I've had the chance to work with great Hegelian uh, scholars, but also with experts of um, uh, other authors of other fields. And uh, I've always found mm, this uh, possibility to exchange and to dialogue with people who knew uh, almost nothing about Hegel, very challenging and very interesting. Uh, during the last years, I've switched my focus to media philosophy and philosophy of technology. And I've mostly worked with uh, uh, colleagues who were at all uh, not familiar with uh, Hegelian dialectics. Now, in my experience, and I do believe that this is a, um, uh, an experience we've all had, when I try and present Hegel's thought on some matter, 
uh, or when I try to make a Hegelian argument about a specific topic, there is a typical reaction. And uh, this reaction can be expressed uh, in the form of a question that somehow starts with, yeah, okay, but ultimately, is it A or B? Um, I do believe that every Hegelian uh, scholar has received this sort of question at least once, even among Hegelians. So uh, it is a natural attitude of human reasoning to, to ask uh, uh, in this way. And uh, these sort of questions are, for instance, I don't know, yeah, okay, but ultimately, are we free or is everything necessary? Yeah, okay, but ultimately, is the individual real or only the universal? Yeah, okay, but ultimately, is reality actually there or is everything only uh, uh, taught? So, in a way, the very uh, opposition between a Hegelian right and a Hegelian left after Hegel's own death can be traced back to this attitude. Again, a natural attitude. Do we want to highlight freedom or grace, the individual or the state, contingency or necessity? It is quite easy to show how this need for a, for a choice, for a simple answer, is uh, strongly anti-Hegelian, anti so to say. And we discussed it with uh, Michaela last, uh, last week. Uh, for instance, in his lectures on the history of philosophy, Hegel does criticize expressly this attitude with, uh, the words, uh, with these uh, words. Uh, simplicity became established as the principle of what is true. Among us, for instance, this takes the form that the proposition is either true or not true, and that one must answer either yes or no to a given question, that an object cannot have two opposite predicates. This is the principle of simplicity. Now, in other words, this need for a simple answer is a result of the refusal to think dialecti uh, dialectically or speculatively. Speculative thought is that form of complex thinking that makes it possible to understand why this kind of questioning about Hegel's philosophy is wrong at its very core. Now, let's go to the question of contradiction. On the one hand, the so-called law of contradiction can be identified with what Hegel calls principle of simplicity. We need a simple answer because we refuse to accept that contradiction can be thinkable, real, true. In this way, the rejection of the law of contradiction is at least a, necess a necessary, if not a sufficient condition in order to gain access to the domain of speculative thought. The struggle between the coherentist and the dialectist uh, interpretations of Hegel's uh, philosophy do revolve around these two questions. Namely, uh, in its weak form, is there speculative thinking without uh, endorsing the possibility of a true contradiction, or in its strong form, is speculative thinking anything else than the statement, then contradiction can be true. Now, according to this view, then questioning contradiction is a way to overcome abstract thinking. On the other hand, however, uh, another view is maybe, is maybe possible. The question whether contradiction is true or not can also be interpreted as another expression, as another uh, instance of the principle of simplicity. In other words, the question could sound like this. Yeah, okay, but ultimately, are contradictions true or not? In this way, two interpretations of speculative thinking are possible. For the first, the question about contradiction is an access path to speculation. For the second, the question about the truth of contradiction is part of those ways of thinking, arguing, and questioning that must be overcome in order to start thinking speculatively. As you probably imagined, I will try and make the case for the second way of looking at things with respect to Hegel philosophy. Uh, this approach has much to do, of course, with the way we want to read Hegel's texts. In the debate on the truth of contradiction, a typical approach has been the research for passages that can support the uh, image of Hegel as an endorser or a rejecter of the law of non-contradiction. Even during this seminar, many of these passages have been already quoted, discussed, and commented. Now, setting aside the fact that this strategy, while perfectly understandable, uh, is quite an Hegelian 
Uh, I, I would like to start from this question. Why, why is it that Hegel's works offer us passages that endorse contradiction and passages that defend the law or non-contradiction? How is it that Hegel's own work gives us enough textual references both for a coherentist and a dialectist reading? In other words, why is it perfectly possible to um, propose a coherentist and a dialectist image of Hegel's philosophy starting from the text of Hegel's works, of Hegel's works? Now, I won't go through these passages again, since I believe we are all familiar with, uh, with these passages. Uh, for the sake of my argument, I will only mention two examples. The, the, the most striking one, in my opinion, is in the lectures uh, on history of philosophy, where Hegel celebrates Heraclitus for uh, his stance on contradiction. And just a few pages after that, does also celebrate against Heraclitus, explicitly uh, uh, criti uh, criticizing Heraclitus, Aristotle's law on non contradiction taking it as an example of speculative thought and not as an example of formalistic um, logic. So why is it uh, that Hegel defines contradiction as real as in, in this passage that I, I believe uh, it came up maybe during uh, uh, a previous paper, but uh, so um, it's really short. It is said that contradiction cannot be taught, but it, uh, in the pain of the living being, it is even an actual concrete existence. And how is it possible that he also states a substantial identity between finitude, um, falsehood and contradiction as in the following passages. I quote, the truth is that the absolute is because the finite is the immanently self-contradictory opposition because it is not. Or again, finite things in their indifferent variety are therefore just this, to be contradictory, internally fractured and bound to return to their ground. So the answer I would like to propose to this question is that Hegel, uh, Hegel's ambiguity on this matter is due to the fact that the question whether contradiction is true or not, is not strictly speaking uh, a Hegelian question. It is not strictly speaking Hegel's question. Now, uh, don't throw me out uh, uh, yet. I'm not saying, of course, that this is not a significant, a meaningful, an important, a crucial question. Uh, I'm arguing that from a Hegelian point of view, this way of putting the question uh, is highly problematic. First of all, as it already emerged in the, the discussion on, on Michela's paper, uh, what does it even mean that a contradiction is true? In other words, how can a contradiction, a set of statements, be true according to a philosophy that structurally and explicitly questions the possibility for any statement to be true? This way of thinking does correspond to what Hegel calls in the uh, preface to the phenomenology of spirit, uh, dogmatism. And here, this is a long quotation, but I will maybe uh, summarize it. Uh, the dogmatism, uh, I quote, the dogmatism of the way of thinking in, um, in both the knowing of philosophy and the study of it is nothing but the opinion that truth consists either in a proposition, which is a fixed result, or else in a proposition which is immediately known. Then, uh, however, the nature of such a so-called truth is different from the nature of philosophical truths. Now, from this standpoint, the answer that some contradictions are true and some other uh, contradictions are not, is in my opinion, not satisfactory because uh, in Hegelian terms, it, does, uh, it is a solution that does obey to the rule of the understanding, namely to separate, to distinguish, and to uh, keep separated what has to remain, to remain one. It is a quantitative answer, if, we, if, you, if you will. Now, by highlighting that Hegel could not have uh, been interested in answering to the question whether contradiction are true, I'm not trying to dismiss the question. What I'm trying to do is to identify Hegel's own possible contribution to a better understanding of what we are actually looking for when we investigate the relationship between contradiction and truth. Therefore, I do believe that a more Hegelian way to put the question uh, we're asking maybe is, what is the relationship 
between contradiction and speculation. What is the role of contradiction in the specific and odd activity we engage in when we try to think speculatively? In order to answer to this question, I will say a few words on the history of the term speculation uh, as it has been developed in the, and used in the history of Western philosophy. And after that, I will try and discuss the specificity of Hegel's own use of this term. Now, as you know, the Latin uh, term speculatio is at first simply a translation of the Greek term theoria. Uh, in this first and broader sense, for instance, speculative reason is differentiated uh, from practical reason. However, in the Latin metaphysical tradition, the reference to speculative thought progressively gains a more uh, specific uh, uh, meaning. For instance, according to Thomas Aquinas, speculative and practical reason are both specific of the human uh, nature. Practical reason only belongs to humans because only humans of all rational beings do desire. Hmm? God and angels, they, they don't desire, basically. Speculative reason, on the other hand, has to be regarded as a specific kind of contemplation. As Aristotle stated in his metaphysics, all rational beings contemplate, God uh, included. However, while angels do have an intuitive, that is a direct and immediate access to, to truth, simply uh, apprehensio veritate intueri, humans only have that, uh, a discursive, mediated access to it. Here, we are not talking about all kinds of truth, but only about uh, the so-called metaphysical truth, namely the truth about God, basically. Uh, now, in this case, Thomas proposes a, a precise etymology for the word speculative. And he says, sorry, I was too lazy to find the English translation, but uh, it, it is quite simple. So um, um, speculation, th those who speculate, are said starting from the Latin word speculo, not specula, namely uh, speculum is mirror and uh, specula is a small hope. So uh, to look at something through a mirror is to look at uh, the cause through its effects um, and through, so to say, uh, a sort of uh, similitude, uh, we could say an analogy between the cause and the effect. For this reason, uh, speculation seems to be reduced to a form of meditation. Now, this reference, um, the reference here, of course, is to St. Paul, to the well-known motto in his letter, to the first letter to the Corinthians, videmus nunc per speculum et in enigmata. Differently from angels, our knowledge must go through the double process of compositio and resolutio. In, other, um, in another work, in his commentary to the sentences, Thomas proposes a difference between contemplation and uh, speculation. And he says, basically, um, the name, the term contemplation does mean uh, an, uh, that, that ground, that um, uh, originary act through which someone, um, through which um, um, God uh, contemplates in himself. On the, other, on the other hand, uh, speculation does refer to the, to the act through which um, someone um, stares, uh, regards the divine things as if uh, in a mirror. So speculation is a mediated knowledge that gains uh, access to a certain kind of object, this is very important. Uh, to, uh, so speculation is a mediating knowledge of a certain kind of object through finite uh, being. Sensible things are a mirror, so to say, a sort of screen, an interface, if you, if you will, in which we see God as in a reflection. For Thomas, who follows Aristotle, both empirical and speculative knowledge are coherent. Uh, Mm, speculative knowledge still obeys the law of non-contradiction. It just uses a different method to attain its particular object. 
Now, with Kant, it will be very interesting, of course, to follow the development of the notion of speculation throughout the Middle Ages, but uh, we, we have no time, of course. Uh, with Kant, the situation is slightly uh, different. Following the scholastic tradition, also in Kant's philosophy, the term speculative has a double meaning. In a broader sense, it simply works as a synonym of uh, theoretical. In this way, Kant uses speculative in opposition to practical, just as Thomas Aquinas did. However, in a narrower and uh, maybe more interesting sense, the term speculative describes a specific use of reason. Generally speaking, a speculative use of reason is found when um, no reference to experience is involved in the theoretical process. For instance, while common sense, uh, what, I, what Kant calls Gesunda um, Menschenverstand, must always operate on uh, concrete cases, speculative reason can abstract from concrete cases, concrete examples, and consider concepts and logical notions in abstracto, hmm? so Kant, in the critic of your reason. Now, eminently speaking, Kant defines uh, speculative knowledge as follows. A theoretical cognition is speculative if it pertains to an object or concepts of an object to which one cannot attain in any experience. It is opposed to the cognition of nature, which pertains to no object or they predicates except those that can be given in a possible experience. In a way, Kant's definition of speculative knowledge seems to be identical to the Thomistic one. Of course, the big difference between the two is that according to Kant, while our natural cognition entails no contradiction, speculative knowledge necessarily results in contradiction, namely in the antinomies of pure reason. Both for Thomas and uh, for Kant, speculative knowledge entails a specific method and a specific object, but the outcomes of this enterprise are different. While for Thomas, we can actually gain speculative knowledge of God, for Kant, the speculative knowledge of transcendent object, that is God, the word, uh, and the soul is only apparent. This is Kant uh, 101, I'm sorry, but it is uh, only to remark the difference between Thomas and Kant's use of the notion of speculation. Now, uh, before coming to Hegel, I would like to briefly discuss the use of the term speculative in another uh, setting that is in the contemporary debate, uh, in particular by French philosopher uh, Quentin Meillassou. Meillassou's main work after finitude uh, has in fact given new life to the term speculative in the human sciences. Uh, since its uh, uh, publication uh, in English in 2007, we do speak, we have started again uh, speaking of speculative realism, of a so-called speculative turn in philosophy, even of speculative design, and uh, everything has become speculative after, after that book. Uh, now, I will quote just a, a sentence from After Finitude. Let us call speculative every type of thinking that claims to be able to access some form of absolute. And let us call metaphysics um, every type of thinking that claims to be able to access some form of absolute being or access the absolute to the principle of sufficient reason. Now, interestingly, the distinction between speculation and metaphysics frees speculative thought from the reference to uh, an object, basically. However, speculative thinking does still obey to some sort of territorial uh, demarcation. Speculative knowledge is knowledge about what overcomes the limits uh, the boundaries of so-called correlation, namely the domain of what Kant would call a uh, possible experience. For this reason, uh, an at least implicit reference to contradiction is to be found. While Meyasu does endorse the law of non-contradiction, it is prima facie evident that the idea of a thinking that claims uh, access to an absolute does entail at least some sort of paradox, some sort of uh, uh, first level contradiction. Toad claims to have a relation to what has no relation to anything at all. Therefore, with respect to the Thomistic and Kantian 
definition of speculative. Miyasuk's uh, use of the term loses the necessary reference to an object, as I said. So uh, in, in Miyasuk's own terms, speculative thinking can be non-metaphysical. However, by underlining the relation between uh, um, the speculative and the absolute, Meyasu does also highlight the paradoxical nature of uh, speculative knowledge. Now, before going on to uh, um, and, and before going to coming to, to Hegel's philosophy, I'd like to summarize and to highlight some aspects of the notion of speculative as uh, it has been elaborated by the tradition and by contemporary thought. So first of all, a first important element for me is that speculative thought is defined by a certain domain. Speculative knowledge transcends experience um, and speculative knowledge is knowledge of a certain field of reality, so to say. Secondly, the difference uh, of domain is also a methodological difference. Speculative cognition does not follow the same methodology, the same process, the same um, steps of natural cognition. Speculation does not work like experience, uh, but is rather the opposite of experience, we would say. So this extensional and uh, methodological separation, if not opposition between speculation and experience is a core element in the discussion of the role of contradiction throughout the history of Western uh, philosophy. In fact, three main stances can be identified with regard to the relationship between contradiction, experience, and metaphysics. Here, I will be very uh, tranchant. It, it's basically false, but uh, for the sake of, uh, of the taxonomy, it can be uh, maybe useful. First of all, an Aristotelian position, which we find, for instance, in Thomas Aquinas. So according to the first stance, speculation and natural knowledge do differ for their objects and for their methodology, but they both respect the principle of non-contradiction. Uh, uh, for the second uh, stance, which we could call platonic, because uh, it can be found somewhere in Plato, even though Plato also um, offers a completely different view on the, on the matter. But according to this second option, the word of natural experience is contradictory because subject to change, underdetermined, unsteady, and so on. And the word of idea, so the domain of the speculative is coherent, non-contradictory because it is eternal, steady, well-determined. There is then a third position, um, which can be summarized, uh, to which uh, Kant can be ascribed, uh, namely that while natural knowledge is coherent, speculative knowledge ends up entangled in contradiction. So in a way, we have this difference of domain. Uh, we can either say that both kinds of knowledge are coherent, are, are non-contradictory, uh, or we can say that the first, um, so the natural cognition is non-contradictory while speculative cognition uh, is contradictory. Or we can say that speculative uh, cognition is uh, contradictory and natural cognition is non-contradictory. Uh, now let's come to Hegel's uh, own notion of the speculative. Uh, I will not offer a thorough analysis of all the passages in which Hegel defines or discusses the notion of speculation, mainly because I'd like to think uh, this seminar as a, so to say, uh, as a discussion. And many of these passages have already been mentioned, discussed, commented during the seminar. We all know these passages, basically. Uh, I will only try to point out some uh, particularities of Hegel's own account of speculative thinking on the basis of uh, what I've been saying about Thomas Aquinas, Kant, and uh, uh, Kentama Yasu. First of all, uh, just as in uh, Kant and in the Latin tradition, also in Hegel, the term speculative does have at least two different meanings. In a first sense, speculative philosophy is a synonym of logic, accepting the separation of experience and pure reason, uh, speculative thought belongs to the second domain and not 
to the first. Uh, so in the encyclopedia, for instance, Hegel defines um, speculative philosophy as a, as a, as a synonym of, of, of logic. Uh, however, in a second sense that is strictly related to the first, speculative thinking is not limited to the domain of what transcends experience because experience itself is not outside of the realm of, uh, so, of the so-called pure logical forms. While logic as a science claims to be independent from experience, uh, the logical element, what Hegel calls das Logische, is present at every level of reality, from sensible experience to abstract entities. The categories of the logic are not only meant to describe the absolute, they constitute the logical structure of everything. For this reason, a first difference of Hegel's account of speculative thought is that it refuses both the extensional and the methodological separation between natural empirical cognition and speculative uh, knowledge. In a way, uh, this is how I read, for instance, this passage, every determination, anything concrete, every concept is essentially a unity of distinguished and distinguishable elements, which by virtue of the determinate essential uh, difference pass over into elements which are contradictory. So more importantly and uh, more radically, the greatest difference between Hegel's account of the speculative and Thomas Aquinas or Kant's definition of it is that speculative thinking is not defined through a specific object, but, through a, uh, but rather through a certain way of thinking its objects, that is, uh, of, thinkings, uh, of thinking conceptual determinations. God, the soul, the word are no longer the specific objects of speculative knowledge, everything is. This, uh, incidentally, uh, is the reason of Hegel's appreciation for ancient uh, skepticism. The ancient skeptics understood that sensible experience is the first and the most immediate field for the exercise of a negative speculative uh, reason. So in a way, the relationship between speculative thinking and contradiction must be radicalized. Contradiction does not just occur when thought addresses a specific kind of conceptual content. For instance, I don't know, movement uh, or life or the absolute as some interpretations uh, suggest. All conceptual determinations from the speculative point of view do entertain a relationship with contradiction. The impossibility to set a boundary uh, between different kind, uh, kinds of, uh, of objects, namely between the objects of natural cognition and the objects of speculative cognition, is that the latter is not, uh, strictly speaking, an object. So the, the object of speculative cognition per se is not really a, a thing, so to say. According to Hegel, the idea that the absolute is a, is a thing, a substance, to which we must assign one or more predicates is still a typically dogmatic uh, mindset. And I quote from the encyclopedia, uh, here Hegel is, is talking about ancient metaphysics and he says, this metaphysics presuppose that cognition of the absolute could come about through the attaching of predicates to it. And it investigated neither the peculiar content and validity of the determinations of the understanding nor yet this form of determining the absolute by attaching predicates to it. So for this re reason, Hegel's understanding of truth must be completely different from the application of the correct predicate to a certain subject. Truth is no longer to correspondence, um, is no longer the correspondence of a certain judgment to a certain state of affairs. In other words, logical categories do not uh, represent um, do not represent anything. Here, I'd like uh, to make a remark about the uh, notion of speculation itself. So I'd like to propose a historical thesis. This is maybe a, a historical, a philological proposition I'd like to make. While Hegel takes the word speculation from uh, the Kantian tradition, basically, he takes the term from Kant, uh, his understanding of this notion has no longer much to do with what the tradition had meant with this term. The metaphor of the mirror uh, speculum, uh, 
in fact, does not obey to a clearly, um, does obey to a clearly a representationalist paradigm. Speculative thought is a form of rational mediation that lets us see what we could not uh, see with our natural um, glance, just like a looking glass at a street turn, so to say. What we see in the mirror must correspond to what is in the world or outside of the world. The theoretical model of this form of speculation is still in a way the adeguatio rei et intellectus. Now, in a very well-known uh, book published in 1971, M.J. Abrams uh, um, opposed the model of the lamp to that of the mirror in order to speak about the, the paradigm shift that took place with the Romantic and, uh, and uh, between the late 18th and the, and the 19th century. While the mirror corresponds to a representationalist paradigm, the metaphor of the lamp does refer to an expressivist paradigm. Now, Robert Brandom uh, used this contraposition in order to ground his pragmatist uh, interpretation of Hegel's log logic, but uh, here I'm not much um, referencing Brandom's uh, work. What I'd like to argue is that this view, the logic as a lamp, not as a mirror, could provide a new image of the relationship between speculation and contradiction. According to a representationalist model, the object of speculation is a set of objects. According to an expressivist model, the logic is the expression of a process, of, a, of an action. Hmm? Now, incidentally, in, in, in this sense, I wanted to offer a hermeneutic reading of Hegel's logic. My reference was not the hermeneutical tradition, but rather the notion of uh, expression uh, in Greek but again, this will maybe be uh, the occasion for another paper, I don't know. So it is no chance, I believe, that uh, the metaphor of the lamp does remind of a Neoplatonism. Both in the paragraph 82 of the Encyclopedia and in the lectures on the history of philosophy, Hegel argues that the notion of the speculative corresponds to what Neoplatonist philosophers called the mystical. However, in an addition to the same paragraph, Hegel remarks that the speculative content is beyond the grasp of the understanding, but not beyond uh, thought itself. Strictly speaking, as we already saw, uh, since it is the complete unity of subjectivity and objectivity, the speculative is also not beyond experience. The speculative is not a thing, and, uh, um, but rather a certain way to think. Here lies the sublime irony of Hegel's metaphysics, as I, as I read it, as I find it natural to read it. If you, if you think about it, at the end of all his works, when we are hoping to find God or the supreme being or uh, uh, something similar to it after a long and excruciating speculative path, we find nothing but the path itself cast under a new light. Uh, absolute knowledge, the absolute idea, the culmination of the philosophy of spirit. Here we find no supreme object. Uh, it is, uh, if not the self-transparent method that has led us to that very point. So I'm going to, to conclude now. I've already spoken too much. Um, I will summarize some of the points I've tried to make in this paper. In order to speak of true contradictions, we must think truth as a property of propositions and the object of speculative knowledge as a thing that can have or not have a certain property. I find both assumption to be strongly problematic in Hegel's philosophy. My core argument is that Hegel was not really interested in, in defending or rejecting the principle of non-contradiction because his notion of speculative thinking differently from the one uh, inherited from tradition does not require anything like that. In a way, one could say that there are two ways to go beyond contradiction. The first is to reject the law on contradiction and to state the truth of contradictions, of course, uh, be it some of them or all, or all of them. Another way is to reject the boundary itself between consistency and inconsistency 
and to define the speculative as the domain where this distinction does not count anymore. This again does not mean uh, dismissing the question about contradiction, but in my, in my view, attempting to consider it under a new light. An expressivist account of speculative thinking does not understand contradiction as a state of affairs, but rather as an action. Contradiction is not something the logical categories uh, have or show. It's not a property of the categories. It is something the categories do. While many uh, critics of Hegel's philosophy have accused him of uh, ontologizing language, so to say, um, in the end, I would argue that he does the opposite by radicalizing Aristotle's idea of dialectics. Namely, he creates a logical space, the domain of the speculative, where being itself evolves as through a form of self-communication, namely a domain where uh, things in themselves dialogue with, with each other. Uh, that's it, thank you. So Greg, do you want me to chair this or do you want to do it? Um, well, Graham, you're always so gracious in sharing every session. What, what would you like, especially since you got up so early this morning? Oh, I'm awake now. I'm happy to do it. Okay, all right. Well then please uh, take it away and guide us in our inquiry. Okay, and you'll keep an eye on the... Yeah, the, yeah okay, true. I will, okay. got it. Oh. Thanks, Alex, that was, that was fascinating. I always wondered why this word speculative got used to mean what it does in Hegelian philosophy. Now I know, thank you. Um, look, uh, maybe I'll abuse the chairman's privilege and just say something, then I'll, I'll shut up. And this isn't so much a comment about Hegel, uh, but about modern dialethism, because um, some people have interpreted modern dialethism as the thought that you can talk about consistency, uh, inconsistency, but you've got to do it consistently. So, for example, in, in the discussion of the paradox of self-reference, people sort of bring up paradoxes and say, aha, so your own view is inconsistent, gotcha. Okay, well, you know, you have to think about it very long to see that's silly, right? Because um, dialysists, such as myself, have insisted that dialysism is an inconsistent view. You, you know, not only believe in inconsistency, but you think your own views are inconsistent. And uh, in fact, in a num number of paraconsistent logics, such as LP, you can endorse the law of non-contradiction. So it's a logical truth that it's not the case that A and not A, as well as some contradictions of the form A and not A. So um, I, I know there's a lot more to contradiction going on in Hegel than dialethism, but uh, just the formal machinery of dialethism is, is very um, comfortable, I think, with the picture you presented as Hegel, as both being able to endorse the law of non-contradiction and to uh, contradict it as well. So that, that's just an observation. Yeah, thank you, Graham. I, I, I completely agree. It is, uh, in a way, I, I, I believe it is a really, it's a nuance, so to say, it's, a, it's really, uh, uh, subtle in a way, because um, a possible answer to the to the um, to the kind of question I was referring to in, in the in the beginning, you know. So so, but are are uh, ultimately are are, con are contradictions true or not? You can answer yes and no. It's it's absolutely no problem. And I do believe that Hegel would be perfectly comfortable in saying yes. Of course, uh, the law of non-contradiction is a speculative principle, and contradictions are, uh, are true. My concern with Hegel's philosophy is, uh, my problem with Hegel is, is maybe slightly different. Namely, why is it that in Hegel, uh, we can find so many occurrences in which um, contradiction, uh, being contradictory means being false. That, that, that's the problem. So the, my, my problem is, uh, 
when, when it comes to, Hegelian, to Hegel's philosophy, what I, what I find striking is that uh, this is of course a way of solving it, but uh, I, I'd like to keep, to, 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 to read seriously what Hegel says when he says, in a way, when we have a, a content that is self-contradictory, we have a finite content. So in a way, we have a content that is not fit in order to describe the absolute. And again, we also have <laughs> some passages that say that in order to have a content, uh, a conceptual determination that is fit in order to describe the absolute, it must uh, have something to do with contradiction. So my problem was precisely to to try and uh, and uh, and um, and 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 give a, a different perspective on on this problem. What maybe I do not uh, think is very Hegelian is precisely the, the idea that. So the, the idea of a consistent inconsistency is not very Hegelian in my opinion, but also the idea that some contradictions are true and other contradictions are not true. That's that was my my I believe these are two approaches that maybe don't manage to solve the problem uh, radically, so, so to say. But I do agree with you that Hegel would be perfectly comfortable to uh, endorsing the law on contradiction and to uh, saying that contradiction is real. The problem is saying that in Hegelian terms, saying that contrad contradiction uh, exists does not mean to say saying that contradiction is true. That that's that's what we have been discussing with uh, Michela last time. So the, the, a big a big problem in this discussion is what use of the term true uh, does Hegel make in his yeah. in his work. But thank you. I I, I completely agree with the, with the with a strict point that Hegel will be comfortable with that as well. I yeah. uh, and Michaela persuaded me that uh, var in Hegel doesn't mean what modern logicians mean by it, true no. in English, okay. Um, but for so many logicians nowadays, to say something is true is just the same as saying it. So, you know, to say uh, P and not P is true is just say P and not P. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't think that Hegel will have a problem with saying that some contradictions are true in that sense. Um, but, that, but this is not the notion that of, mm -hmm. of Hegel's notion of truth. I agree entirely. No, thank you. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Uh, okay, let me take the hands in the order they've come up. Uh, Greg. Uh, thanks a lot, Alex, for your talk. Um, yeah, stimulating as always, very interesting. I, I have three questions and we have a little bit of time, so I hope it's okay if I ask all of them. Um, uh, the first one's pretty short. And Greg, do you want to take them one by one? Uh, that way Alex doesn't have to remember them. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, that's that's right. probably kinder. Okay, <laughs> a, a kinder approach. Um, yeah, my, my first question is just um, a historical question, since a lot of the talk was uh, hi historical. And you mentioned at the end that um, and this is what I was uh, thinking about through much of the historical discussion that what, what, what Hegel meant, means by speculative is what in the tradition was understood as the mystical. And of course he says, it's not beyond thought, it's beyond the understanding of course, but not beyond vernunft, okay. I'm just curious why, why um, the mystical wasn't um, more uh, central in your discussion of the history of the concept of the speculative since it seems to be really important for Hegel or is the mystical there in Aquinas or in some of the others? Um, I was hoping that you could say more about that. Is a, I don't know if the Neoplatonists would be another uh, tradition that you also would, would want to discuss alongside the others that you went through. That's my first question. Wait, wait, uh, if you... If you want, you can you can make all three questions. They, they, are they related or? Uh... Um, well, they're all related, but. <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I can I can answer to the first question. Okay. Then. Okay. Thanks to Grant for the opportunity. So yeah. um so Hegel Hegel, Hegel refers to this um, um, connection between um, mystical and uh, speculative in in more than one passage of the lectures. On the history of philosophy, and there is one problem. So the the, the I always like to I mean the, the, at the first glance the big problem is Hegel is a great 
adversary of mysticism. So uh, uh, the, 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 the mystical view is not the Hegelian view, so to say, precisely because of this separation between, I mean, in, in, in principle, what I was trying to uh, implicitly argue is that the, the mystical uh, tradition does represent, that does repropose this uh, separation of domain between what we can say uh, and, uh, and what we can experience and what we cannot uh, experience. So in a way there is this line between the, uh, what we can express and what we cannot express, what we can experience or what we can, uh, what we can experience, but we cannot express. This is, uh, that's a really, it's a really subtle game there. That's the first, the first problem. The, the second problem is when Hegel talks about the mystical is uh, doing something that has not strictly speaking to do with uh, neoplatonic metaphysics. He's doing something that has very much to do with um, Greek culture. So uh, uh, it, it would be, it, the, the, to answer the question, the reason I, I did not focus very much on the problem of the mystical is because it's too big of a problem and partly because one should look at the sources of Hegel in his study of, of Greek culture. Because for instance, the problem is he connects the, the notion of mystical to a mewing, so to the mysteries, the religion mysteries, to Orphism and so on. And his problem is precisely the idea of the mystical as a private experience. So his problem with uh, that, that when, when he discusses in the lectures, the notion of mystical is as when we when we think about when we think about a mystical truth, we think about so to say uh, an hyper subjective, uh, absolutely private experience that is not that we cannot communicate that we cannot share. This was not the Greek idea of the of the mysteries, so to say. So he want to reconnect that tradition. First of all, second of all, the, the problem with the mystical uh, is that when he says these with reference to uh, Neoplatonism, he's doing precisely that, uh, that passage I wanted to uh, propose as, as, a historical, um, as a historical movement, as a, as a historical thesis. Namely, he's not referring to what the tradition, to, the, to what the scholastic tradition referred to with the term speculative, but he's thinking about something else. So he's thinking about the Platonic tradition. Now, the problem with Plato is that, uh, Again, I, I do believe that the, the, the discussion of Plato's dialectics uh, in terms of contradiction is difficult for the same reason the discussion of Hegel's dialectics with, with reference to contradiction is, is difficult. Because in a way, we've discussed this, uh, this uh, uh, with reference to your book, right? So the, the fact that, uh, so which, dial, which, which platonic dialogue must be taken in consideration in order to, to see what's, what is Plato's last words on dialectics. So uh, summarizing the, 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 the relation between the mystical and the speculative is a cultural historical Hegelian thesis and not only so to say a metaphysical logical thesis. That's what it makes, uh, that's what makes it so difficult to discuss and so complex, first thing. Second thing, um, the relationship between uh, Hegel and Platonic thought is very complex. What I think must be um, taken into account and what is very important is the preference of Hegel for Proclus instead of Plotinus. That, that, that's the very interesting thing to, to, to say, but it would be, I mean, one, one would require at least 30, 40 minutes only on this in order to discuss it. Uh, briefly. Yeah, thanks a lot. First question. Let's go on to the second question. question. That's very helpful. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. So maybe your next paper. You can yeah. <laughs> exactly. So uh, let me go ahead and ask these together and just so um, they're systematic questions that are interrelated. So um, what is contradiction in Hegel? Is it um, on Hegel's own terms, it's certainly not just a the property of sentences or a relation between propositions, like you said. But a contradiction, when we ask about the truth of contradiction, we can also think about it in more overtly Hegelian terms, right? So we can think about contradiction is a, is a category. First, it's a category of the logic. And contradiction seems to involve um, 
not just the propositions that can be contradictory or in a contradictory relation, but a category itself can be in contradiction with itself. And so like when you see the formulation of the principle of non-contradiction in the discussion of identity, right? That A cannot be A and not A. So I'm wondering whether if we, you know, discuss it in overtly Hegelian terms rather than in the non-Hegelian ones, um, whether uh, our evaluations would be different. So I just wanted to ask you about um, these other, th this other dimension of contradiction as um, applying not just to the relation of propositions, but to a category itself and the relation that a category has to itself, uh, which also seem to be features of contradiction in the logic. So that's, that's just one of my questions. Um, my other question is just about, I really like the way that you set up the, the principle of simplicity and you're exactly right. Uh, Hegel thinks, yeah, this, this is a problematic principle. Uh, we can't ask, you know, is, is it true uh, you know, is, is it true or not? Okay, so that's a pr this problem, this principle of simplicity is problematic, right? So we could ask, uh, is, does Hegel offer a coherence theory? Or, you know, does he endorse contradiction? So we could, you know, propose this, this false dichotomy. And you point out that we could do one of two things, reject the boundary, or we could, you know, endorse the truth of contradiction. I'm wondering though, whether the rejection of the boundary, whether one can't do both, because that's in my own paper that I gave that and in my book, that's what I want to do. I want to reject the boundary and say there are true contradictions. Maybe also in the spirit of one of Graham's, uh, Graham's comment here, which is that, is it that Hegel has a coherent account or a contradictory one? Okay, that's a problem, right? The contradiction itself needs to be contradictory. Is it true? Well, it's true and it's false. If you think the contradiction as true and false, right, um, you have a contradictory view of contradiction, right? One where contradiction and coherence both are asserted. And then you don't have this uh, opposition anymore, this uh, false opposition, this, this simplicity. So, you know, one way to actually overcome the, one way to overcome the boundary is to assert the truth and falsehood of contradiction that one of the true contradictions is the truth and falsehood of contradiction itself. That's one of the ways of overcoming the boundary or rejecting the boundary is to assert the truth of dialectism. So um, this also has, you know, re requires reference to self-reference that the contradiction itself is, is contradictory. And, you know, this kind of self-referential uh, application. So I'm wondering whether it isn't, a question of either rejecting the boundary or in endorsing a question of true contradiction, that that would reintroduce the problem of the principle of simplicity, but rather that the best dialectic position or the best, the best dialectic reading of Hegel would actually endorse both of those positions, as you're saying. And this is why sometimes when you give arguments, I find myself agreeing with everything you're saying. And I think, but your position is somehow different from mine. So, <laughs> um, I hope my question made some, made a little sense there. That's, that's my main question, my, my main concern. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so uh, second question, the, both really compelling questions. Uh, about the second, what is contradiction? Uh, so in a way, a way to go uh, about this, of course, is to uh, is what has, has already been done, right? So we differentiate, we try and make a list of every occurrence of the term contradiction uh, in the in the Hegelian in, in Hegel's works, and we try, so to say, to differentiate different uses uses of the term, and so to say, how many meanings uh, of the term contradiction are there in Hegel in Hegel? Uh, so. My personal problem with uh, with, with that um, way of uh, of proceeding is that um, there there is always, so to say, the implication that Hegel didn't know very much about logic. So in a way, there is a, a so to say an orthopedic uh, attitude um, toward Hegel. So to say, okay, he uses contradiction in many different ways because he didn't know very much or because the logic at the time was not very uh, well developed. 
So let's let's look at the, the, the many different uses of the term contradiction and let's fix it, so to say. So let's uh, differentiate them. So my problem from a, from a, um, an hermeneutical, from an interpretive point of view is, okay, it's perfectly okay to say that there are different uses of the term, but then I also want to know why he did choose to use the same term for all of them. Uh, and, and for me, I mean, I, I, I start from the assumption that Hegel was not simply ignorant, uh, that he was not simply, you know, uh, well-versed in, in, in logic. Yes. So the... Um, uh, so, so, yeah, but no, because it's not, I mean, it doesn't go without saying because they, they go, that, that, that's, I mean, that was a major line of interpretations in the English speaking world, of course. Hegel did, knew nothing about logic, and therefore we find ourselves with communism. Yeah? Uh, so the, 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 the problem is, um, uh, of course, very, very, very delicate. But so my, my, um, my, my paper would like to, to, to be a, a, a proposal for, a, for an answer to, to this question as well. Namely, uh, why is it, my, my question would be, why is it not important from an Hegelian standpoint to differentiate in such a, a, a strict way between contradiction, opposition, um, contrari contrariety, and, 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 and so on. And in a way, I do believe that the, the, the problem here is precisely that he's not really interested in differentiating between, uh, because these differences are of course very important if you're trying to decide whether the law of non-contradiction is true or not, because that's a problem. You have, you know, you have the contrary, you have the contraries, you have the subcontraries, you have the, the square of oppositions, and you have all those di uh, distinctions that serve in order to uh, you know, uh, be Aristotelian and establish why an opposition does not violate the, the law on contradiction. I believe this is this is not the point uh, in Hegel's in Hegel's work, and that's the reason why he's not really keen on this kind of differentiation. Um, also, I do believe that what you're referring to, so contradiction as a category in the logic, uh, I. I um, I did not publish it, but I when I when I studied, uh, I, I did my master thesis on contradiction in Hegel and Aristotle. And what I found striking is that uh, Hegel's definition of the of some of the determinations of reflection is basically a paraphrase of Aristotle's own uh, definition. So he knew Aristotle very well, uh, and. So what I find interesting is that, as Michela says in her, in her book, uh, contradiction is both a category in the logic and a transcategorial uh, element that comes into play through the, through the whole logic. Self-reference here is not really a problem for me precisely because, um, I mean, it's all one. So the, the problem is not to differentiate between the self-contradictoriness of a category because you, you end up reducing that to a judgment. You end up saying, uh, I don't know, the contradiction is contradictory or contradiction is identical and not identical. So you end up using the same syntax, the same syntactical structure in order to discuss self-reference. Uh, third question, the problem of simplicity. I, I anticipated that, I, I, I'm grateful for it because I, I was wondering, will someone tell me that I, I'm also victim of the principle of simplicity and I also propose, a, a, so to say, a, um, a, a binary uh, option where you could do both. But, well, I'm, just just real briefly, I, I don't mean to say that that, that, Greg, that necessarily. Uh, yeah. we, we've got a queue. I think okay, it's fair to people. Uh, let, let's um, let Alex answer yeah. your question. I think we should yeah. move on. Okay, to okay. be fair to everybody else. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Graham. But by the yeah. way, I, I was. Uh, it was I was saying that jokingly. Yeah. The the the, the problem is my my, my in, in trying to answer to your question. Why can't why cannot we do both? Uh, my problem is precisely the, um, uh, the question of truth. So my problem is precisely uh, uh, keeping true to Hegel's idea that strictly speaking, a judgment or a set of judgments is not true and cannot be true. Because this is, for instance, I mean, in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel uses this very odd expression that he uses only once and never again, 
uh, the speculative proposition, right? The speculative judgment. And he only uses that in the preface to the, uh, to the phenomenology of spirit and never again. Uh, I, I do believe that the problem there is my, my answer to the question, why cannot we do both? So why cannot we, uh, so to say, refuse the, um, or, or better, endorse the truth of contradiction and refuse the difference between um, uh, so to say, uh, consistency and inconsistency. The problem is, in a way, I'd like to show, I'd like to, to, to argue that for Hegel, this is precisely the problematic aspect, that a contradiction, namely uh, the idea, Aristotel Aristotelically said, so that the idea that the same as and as not the same predicate is true. That's, that's the problem. So uh, it can be, so to say, a marker of the truth. That's what Hegel says, uh, since, since it's uh, the beginning of his work. And um, um, my, I, I'm, I'm closing, sorry. What, what, I, what in my opinion is, is really uh, important is precisely, it's, it's rather unscientific. I mean, it's a, it's a view I have. It's nothing I want to, I, I think I, I can demonstrate, but it is what I try to express in the, in the end of my paper. I have this idea, when I read Hegel, my, my basic understanding of the logic is the idea that uh, it's not me speaking about the categories. It's the categories speaking to each other. So I have this, the, the, the thing, what I, what I imagine when, when I read Hegel's logic is the idea that the, the categories talk to each other. So if you apply this, if you understand Aristotelian or uh, ancient dialectics in this way, contradiction is not a problem anymore because it's part of the process. It's precisely the process. So to say that the process is the truth is precisely to negate the idea that uh, contradiction understood as the, the inherence and non-inherence of a predicate to a subject can be can be true. Again, thank you. Thanks, Lars. Thanks. Okay, good. So cues built up during that discussion. We're going to get everybody in. Okay, uh, Toby, you're next. Well, thank you, Alessandro, for this very rich talk. And I must say, or I'd like to start with that the way how you presented it does resonate quite well with, with my own findings in the text. And um, my question is on what you call yourself the expressionist paradigm. And I think this kind of is a continuation, so to speak, with what you just ended up saying. Um, because um, I find it very helpful to kind of um, think of Hegel's account as an expressionist account in, in opposition to the representationalist account of the tradition. But uh, what does it mean, so to speak, to, to, to flesh this out? And um, so this is where you ended with your, with your talk. And um, so you said that things in themselves are in dialogue, or you also said that the contradiction is what categories do, so to speak. So this is kind of, um, what I would like to, to put your intention on and be more um, explicit on it, because um, my point of view in this is that if we are to endorse the very idea of dialectism in Hegel, it's not only a logical point of view or, so to speak, a subjective point of view. It's not only about predication and judgment, but it's also about the a different ontology. So the rejection of duplicity is it's a change in the ontology. So. Um, if we, if I have a look then in what happens in the second part of the subjective logics, the um, the objectivity chapter, yeah, this is where he is very explicit in coming up with, for example, an understanding of causality as communication. In the German original, he speaks of Mitteilung, it's communication. So it's it's not that we have some sort of a causality in the sense of. A is there and has an effect, which is B, but they kind of communicate A and B. And it's a sort of an asymmetric sort of reciprocity. And this is explicitly where kind of, oh, I mean, I take this to be an anti herdelinian point of view because um, the what things are in their very, um, you know, the, the ursprüngliche Urteilung, you know, this Herderlin talk of um, the undividedness. He's very explicit in rejecting this and say, well, everything is in communication and everything is in this relation. So what is initially there is communication, it's Mitteilung. He plays with this kind of, you know, with a dash. Yeah? And it's kind of Heideggerian, so to speak, in a certain, certain extent. And I think this is, this is a textual evidence. What I would like to hear more is how would, would you bring this in line with your idea of expressionist? Or is that something 
uh, or something different you have in mind? Because I would think this is explicitly helpful in order to kind of spell out the idea of an expressionist um, ontology. But, but or maybe I mis have mistaken your approach. But I think this would be um, very helpful if it would be more precise, more explicit on this. Yeah, thank you, Tobias. Uh, in a way, um, I worked very much on Holderlin in um, uh, fragment on the judgment, the, the two pages, but so dense, right? And and uh, uh, it is a, a very important question in development in the development of Hegel's idea of logic. Um, I'll try to answer the, your, your your question in the, in the uh, in, in, in the most sincere and then maybe not formally correct way, but I want to 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 explain myself. Um, so when I when I say uh, when I when I uh, mm, propose a contraposition between a representationalist and an expressivist account of logic, so to say, uh, the idea is uh, on one end, logic is so to say. Uh, 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 a representation of something else. So we, we, we so to say, uh, elaborate, develop this structure in order to, to, to say something about something that is not what we are describing, but it in, in some way reflects what we are describing. So uh, a, rep a representationalist account of, of, uh, of speculation, that's precisely so. So I cannot see God, I cannot see the absolute, but I find a mediation, I find, so to say, a logical instrument that lets me, that allows me to to, to speak about it and to and to relate to it, even though I cannot experience it, so to say. And so you have two different uh, dimensions: experience and, so to say, pure reasoning, or how you want to call it. Uh, what I what I like about Hegel's logic is that there is no distinction of the sort. So logic does not does not only deal with the absolute. Logic does deal with everything we can talk about, everything we can think, even the I mean. Uh, uh, every detail, minor detail of uh, human experience must be grasped in the structure of, uh, of, of the logic. And that's, that's what I find really uh, fascinating. And when I say it is an expressivist account, what I mean is that in a way it is like, um, so it, it, it's very bold, but it, it's, an eto it, it's kind of an ethology of, of, uh, of, the, of the logical realm. You know, when you, when you, when you, when you want to, 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 to watch the behavior of a wild animal, you have to, in a way, keep a distance and you know, stay there and, 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 and watch. And this is precisely what Hegel says in the phenomenology. So this is strictly speaking, perfectly right for the phenomenology. So what does the philosopher do? The philosopher just stays still and looks at the conscience and, uh, watches the, the, the self-development, the, the journey of conscience. For the logical structures, my, my, my argument is uh, uh, the, the categories uh, do not represent something else, but they uh, do something. They act with each other. And the logic is precisely the, uh, so to say, the, um, not the description, but it is like a log. It is the. It is simply the, uh, so to say, the the, mm, the the trace we could say of of this dialogue of the categories with themselves, and they do this. And what they are doing is not something detached from experience or from uh, uh, reality. It is what we find in reality. So it is only a way to express what we find in reality every moment. The difference between what I argue and what Brandom argues, for instance, is that, is that uh, in, in, in my opinion, the case could be made that uh, Brandom's, so to say, um, uh, pragmatist uh, expressivism is still a form of representationalism because in the way, in a way, Brandom, argue, Brandom says, these categories do represent human actions. So uh, human communication. So these categories are in a way, uh, um, so to say, rules that describe the way humans talk, the way humans argue with each other. And the difference with what I'm trying to propose is that uh, the logic does not describe human communication, does not describe um, a human reasoning, does not describe a certain way to, to talk. It does something slightly different, namely, uh, it is just the expression of something absolutely 
uh, autonom uh, uh, autonomous, independent, that has his own way of behaving and that we can find everywhere in, in human communication, in nature, in, uh, in the religious experience uh, and, and so on. So absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, it is not just uh, to say a logic, it is of course an ontology. It does change the way we look at, uh, at reality. And uh, suggest, and then I, I close, I'm sorry I'm being too long, is the, the idea that, so when I said, usually we accuse Hegel of ontologizing language, but we must do the opposite. Uh, of course, you do both things at once. So the idea is if you reject the difference between things and categories, if you reject the difference between, so to say, the logic and uh, logic and reality, when you're describing logical, the logical process, you are also describing how reality works. So uh, uh, if I say, so to say, that uh, uh, in the logic, being is in dialogue and categories do relate to each other dialectically, namely as if they are speaking to each other. So, so we say uh, the same happens with things. So everything is uh, connected precisely in the same way because there's no difference. There's no other place for logic. There's not a logical domain uh, somewhere and then reality. So uh, that's the idea. Th thank you. Sorry if I had to be so brief. Okay, uh, uh, and my apologies too, because my line dropped out. Alex, were you still answering Toby's question? Absolutely. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, the hands have rearranged themselves in my absence. So I'm gonna to stick to what I remember. Um, Elena, you're next. Thank you, Alessandro, for your talk. I am uh, very uh, sympathetic with this uh, view about uh, Hegel's logic, kind of empiristic, uh, so kind of uh, empiristic view of logic and also I was uh, also wondering uh, um, what uh, the difference between your approach and Brandom's approach was, but uh, um, I, I, I think uh, uh, your answer to Tobias was very clear and I completely, um, so I, 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 am, I, I, I like your <laughs> hypothesis more than Brandom's hypothesis. Um, so I just wanted to, to know, um, uh, a little bit more about the Aristotelian background of your uh, approach, and especially about uh, the relationship between hermeneutics, uh, Aristotelianly conceived, and uh, dialectics, Ar Aristotelianly conceived, and their relation to Hegel. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Elena. Um, so, um, the 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 um, you are basically asking me to 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 try and and uh, and 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 say something about the part of the paper I I did not include in my final uh, draft. Uh, what I what I wanted to uh, to say basically is that. Mm, there are two elements I would call the hermeneutic about my reading of Hegel. Uh, one in the classical sense, so in the uh, where hermeneutics is understood as what we call hermeneutics uh, today, and one in the Aristotelian sense. On the one hand, uh, I, I've I've studied Hegel with a scholar of with a with a pupil of uh, Luigi Parison. Uh, you you know him very well, of course. So. I, I have studied Hegel in a, in a context where uh, Hegelian speculative philosophy was regarded under uh, strong suspicion. So uh, the, the idea was uh, not normally, so to say, the, the, the um, philosophers, in, philosophers in Turin are not very keen on, on Hegel's dialectics, as you, as you probably, as you, as, you, as, you, as you know very well. So the, the, the thing is, in, in a way, uh, what I what I try to, to do is that uh, in the in Hegel's logic, and according to this reading of Hegel's logic, what happens with regard to the notion of speculation is precisely that we have this tension between the domain of expression and the domain of uh, uh, pure thought that uh, remains a tension. So there is an hermeneutical dimension in Hegel that can be 
uh, expressed, for instance, through the um, relationship between understanding and reason or representation and concept. So that, that's, a, that's a, an open uh, element in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Hegel's philosophy. Uh, I, I, I will dare say it is, if we, if we think about speculative philosophy, there is, so to say, a strictly logical metaphysical way of thinking about it, which is what I've tried to do today. And there is another way of seeing at it uh, from the point of view of subjective spirit. So what happens from the point of view of the subjective spirit when we think speculatively? Uh, and if we do so, then the problem becomes the problem of the relationship between representations and concepts, between the, the problem of the relation between understanding and reason. And it is, of course, the, the problem of, uh, of speculation. I mean, the whole the whole debate on speculation all, all often revolves around this problem of uh, uh, contradiction being connected to, un to the understanding and not to reason or being connected to reason in a different way uh, than uh, it is connected to the understanding and so on. So in a first sense, uh, what I wanted to, to do is to try and uh, say something on this element in Hegel's philosophy, namely speculation as the domain where um, representation and concept interact with each other, so to say. But I had no time to develop it, this, so uh, I, I completely abandoned it. The Aristotelian uh, uh, aspect, so the second aspect, was precisely what I call expressivism. So here I'm thinking about Giorgio Colli, the translator of Nietzsche in, uh, in Italian. He had this very, very, um, strange translation of the word logos. Uh, he translates logos as expression. And he has uh, created a, a philosophy of expression that's uh, very interesting in my opinion and where um, a, a key role is played by Aristotle's De Interpretazione, simply because uh, precisely the, the perier meneas uh, basically means about the expression. So in a way, uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, um, try and think about the category of expression in Hegel's philosophy. And the only thing I said was answering to Tobias the difference between what I mean by expression and what uh, random means by, by expression. But there, the, the, a big problem, an issue that I do believe uh, I discussed it with, with Greg, uh, is not very much, uh, is not something Hegel focuses on uh, as much as other philosophers, for instance, uh, Fichte is the pragmatics of truth. So the idea that truth is not only something that is there, is also something that you have to express. It's also something that you have to say. Eh? The problem of telling the truth, the problem of saying the truth is a problem that is huge in, uh, in Fichte's philosophy, for instance, not maybe so uh, a big focus in Hegel's philosophy. And so my idea of the logic as a sort of uh, dialogue of, of inner dialogue of the categories with themselves was an attempt to try and give a, a, a solution to uh, an answer to this problem, namely how can we express the truth? How, how is truth something that we have to, to say? Something that is not simply there because, because that's, that's precisely the core of Hegel's argument that truth is not something that is there and that in a second moment, you, you express or you say. The problem is it's not you saying it. So that's the very complex matter at hand when we talk about uh, expressivism in Hegel's, in Hegel's philosophy. Uh, I've been very, very vague in my, in my answer, but I, I promise uh, as soon as I have something written down, I will be more than happy to discuss it with you. Uh, um, that's all I can say for now. Thank but you. thank you for your question. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, Franca, I think you are next in my memory. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, mm, I have to put. Okay, okay, bye. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, um, Alex, uh, for this interest, for your interesting. I want to know more 
about uh, speculative. Well, I, I think you mean you are referring to speculative realism, smola soup is uh, okay. Is this uh, basically, I don't know so much about that movement, so I cannot say. My question, um, well, in a sense, my question has been already answered, partially answered, uh, uh, because I think that Greg, uh, in a sense, uh, asked a similar question. Uh, um, it is about uh, the principle of simplicity. Uh, that quotation uh, concerning the principle of sim simplicity. The uh, Hegel says uh, that uh, this idea of simple to true uh, is uh, uh, based on uh, three very different things. First, uh, bivalence. So it is uh, the idea that uh, there must be true or not true. Okay. Uh, and so there, okay. Second, the second thing is uh, that uh, there can be, there cannot be a simple answer to a question. So if you say yes or no, but not yes and no. And the third thing is that an object cannot have two opposite predicates. Okay, these are three very different things because to a certain extent, one may reject one of these three things while accepting others, well, there could be different positions. Was uh, Hegel somehow aware that, that there was there were these possibility of rejecting one aspect, for instance, uh, the idea of bivalence, but not uh, the idea of the simple answer to one question or the idea of the simple, okay. First, and second, is the speculative realism more this contemporary speculativism, so to say, uh, aware of this difference? Uh, so the, the idea of the complexity of truth, the non-simplicity of truth in speculative realism is uh, uh, aware that, that there is this difference. The second question is, uh, is uh, simply is it simply true that philosophy is not that philosophical truth is not simple? Stupid question in a sense, but the old the old elactic uh, argument tells us uh, that uh, Hegel's dialectics uh, should be dialectized uh, as uh, many many interpreters. Uh, to begin with Kierkegaard that you mentioned at the beginning, thought. Okay, bye. Thank, Thank you, you if you have that. time, but anyway, we can discuss all the other things later also if you want. Well, we are close to each other now, so we can <laughs> discuss it in person maybe. But uh, uh, aside from that, I don't know, th thank you very much for the questions. Uh, so general uh, answer about speculative realism. Um, it is, I find it really fascinating. It is, it is a vogue. So it is, it is a, so to say, a fashion in, 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 in a way. Uh, but uh, for instance, uh, Megasus book, This After Finitude is really a really interesting book. And uh, it is really, his argument about correlationism is, in my opinion, very compelling. And it is a very interesting way of um, proposing speculative thought in all its paradoxality, so to say. Because what is striking is that Meyasu does endorse the, print, the loan on contradiction. So he does not believe that contradictions are true. Uh, but he has this paradoxical argument re, uh, regarding, uh, so to say, the possibility of, of taught to grasp what is not taught in a way. And, and it is 
a very fascinating reading in my opinion, but uh, aside from that, uh, I'd say speculative realism is not very much um, uh, interested in, in these Hegelian uh, matters we are discussing in this seminar. Uh, however, the, the first question about the principle of simplicity, uh, I, I believe that uh, a close reading of the chapter on the, the, on the determinations of reflection in the science of logic is a way to, it, that's, that is the, the, the moment, uh, that, that is the, so to say, the, the passage where Hegel shows that he knows some of the distinctions you are proposing and criti criticizes them. So uh, in, in a way, uh, he recognizes that bivalence and I don't know, uh, for instance, he recognizes that the, the, the law of the excluded middle and the law of non-contradictions are two different principles, but he also criticizes this distinction. So, uh, but, but that I, I, I'd say that's the passage to read. That's the, the, that's the, the, the work to read if, if one wants to, um, to answer to your, to your question. Uh, I, find, I find it really uh, interesting that the second principle you mentioned, namely the, the simple answer. Because in my opinion, uh, what, what Hegel is really interested in is precisely in saying that the second uh, element, so the need for a simple answer is what trumps the other two. So the, the problem for Hegel is not much uh, preserving bivalence or preserving, uh, so to say, the non-contradiction in the uh, inherence of predicates to an object. Uh, his problem is precisely the idea of regarding truth as something fixed, as something that you, know, you can yeah. state yeah. once and for all. Reason for, for this reason, uh, I do believe that your question is not at all stupid. It's precisely what Hegel would have wanted to do. Uh, and uh, so the idea, uh, well, correct me if I, if I say it wrong. Uh, the question, is it simply true that uh, philosophy or philosophical truth is not simple? Uh, the answer, of course, it's not. <laughs> the answer, of course, it's, it's absolutely not true because nothing is simply true, first of all. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> second of all, it is... Uh, I mean, if you want to reduce uh, truth to the statement that nothing uh, is uh, is simply true, then the answer is no. That, that's that's also not uh, yeah. not true uh, because I, I do believe that that that's what I wanted to radically uh, state. So Hegel's idea of truth is not uh, the, the idea of a statement. So there is there is no statement. So in a letter to to Goethe, he said. Uh, uh, dialectics, in a way, is nothing but the spirit of contradiction. And I read this spirit of contradiction, you know, as, as the child that always wants to say no. And, and I do believe that, that uh, this is something profoundly uh, eradicated in Hegel's idea of dialectics. Uh, if we want to, to state truth in the form of a, of a simple proposition, w whatever proposition will be not true, according to Hegel. That's my that's my my statement. So uh, that's of course false, but but thank you for for your thank you for your question. Well, yeah, but well, my question. Franca, was... Franca, I'm going to move the discussion on. In fairness to people still in the queue, okay? You can you can have a coffee with with Alex uh, in a nice coffee shop and chat further, okay? Uh, Stefan, I think you are next. Thank you. And thank you, Alessandro, for your very interesting talk. I was especially pleased with the part on medieval philosophy. Um, but I think there was something wrong because, um, so you said that in Aquinas or that there is this um, Aristotelian idea of speculation, which is somehow just a translation of Theoria. And mm -hmm. then we have this kind of new idea where it's a specific um, topic or object. But your quotation, as I remember, it was from the from Aquinas' commentary on the books of sentences. And I think he, um, I think he's just referred, so um, the passage that um, speculation is a dark mirror where we can, illum speculatione, uh, I think it was another one. 
in yeah look it's from the commentary on the third book of the sentences um yeah. illum actum in rebus so this is just a quotation from augustine because augustine says mm -hmm. in his de trinitate that um speculation is like a is a mirror where um where we can see or like a darkened mirror i think he says where we can see um, the divine things. So, and the commentary on the sentences is one of the earliest writings of um, Aquinas. And I think the more common um, idea of speculation with the scholastics, scholastics, not with Aquinas and the church, doc uh, Augustine and the church doctors, is simply speculation as theoretical philosophy. You can clearly see it if you look at. Um, that there is this new grammar school, the modests who think of speculative grammar. Speculative grammar has nothing to do with theology or whatever. It's mm -hmm. just um, that they think grammar can be established as a theoretical discipline at the universities in contrast to the uh, idea of grammar as just a practical discipline. So I think that um, the idea that speculation is something with a specific object or topic, which is somehow transcending um, experience is neither um, Thomistic nor is it really scholastic. I think it's more from Augustine and Aquinas was especially opposed to the Augustinians at Paris um, that they think there is a kind of um, recognition or knowledge that can transcend experience. For Aquinas, everything comes from experience and sense perception. He doesn't think that we have a kind of knowledge transcending in this sense that it doesn't have to start from experience. So I think this was kind of um, odd or uh, confused. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this was just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. It's uh, really helpful. Uh, you're, of course, uh, absolutely right. This is a quotation from Augustine. Um, the, the problem is, uh, what is the difference? So what, what is the, the difference between the mindset, the Augustinian mindset and the Thomistic uh, mindset? Uh, the big difference is the um, uh, hierarchia. So the big difference is the question about angels. So uh, what, what uh, you, you're perfectly right in, in, uh, in Augustine uh, and I mean, in, in Boethius and in late antiquity, so to say, um, speculatio is only a translation of theoria. Uh, what happens in the, in the uh, so to say, uh, high scholastic, so uh, is that the problem is not only to, uh, so to say, provide an anthropology uh, of human reason, but also to differentiate human reason from other forms of, uh, of reason. This is a problem Kant still has. So when Kant, for instance, talks about, uh, says all rational beings, he says all rational beings because his problem is to uh, leave open the possibility that there is a rational being that is not human being, so to say. So, but just take a look. Um, I know what you want to say, but um, he, when he talks about this hierarchy, look at um, De Veritate Questio 16 on Synderesis. There he uses this hierarchy and he, uh, he refers to um, Dionysius Areopagita and his um, yeah. divine hierarchy. But um, there he says, oh, yes, we must have something in common with the angels. Of course. And this is the intellect. But here Aquinas says it's only the knowledge of principles. So in fact, it's only the knowledge of um, the principle of non-contradiction in theory. Yeah, precisely. And there he exactly says in speculation, it's the law of non-contradiction and practice it's synder or in praxis it's synderesis. So what we would now call conscience. So if you want the, 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 um, the, the quotation you want to look at and maybe we can discuss it per email if you want is this one because this is from the Summa Theologia and here is the passage where, I mean, I have the full passage if you want. Here is where he expressly sets the difference between angels and humans, so to say. And the problem is, of course, uh, you, ha you have no uh, direct knowledge of what is beyond experience. That's precisely uh, the, the position of Thomas Aquinas. So the idea, no, for instance, that the ontological 
uh, proof does not work, that you need to, you, you, you have to use the five paths, right? So the, the problem is, uh, the, 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 the idea is precisely that according to, to, to Thomas in this passage, then of course, Thomas is, I mean, is written so much and I'm not an expert, but I, 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 I've read a few articles. It is a, a topic I'm, I'm largely interested in. The, the main problem is while uh, uh, use the, the verb intuere for angels. So angels do have an intuition of a divine truth, which is not the principle, which is not the first principles of the divine truth. Humans do have a mediated cognition of the divine truth. Namely, they have to use experience as a mirror. So this is the main difference. And this is a difference that you cannot find in Augustine because Augustine, since uh, uh, Dionis, I'm used to talk about him in French, but Dionysus, uh, Aeropagitas, okay? Uh, uh, it comes after Augustinus, of course. So it is a problem that's not, that's not yet uh, present in the in the in the context of, of, of Augustine. So um, it, what I wanted to strike is precisely this. This does not mean that we have direct access to uh, divine truth. It means the opposite, that we have no direct access to the divine truth. And in a way, uh, what what is uh, so to say a specific of human knowledge is that we must use a, a medium that we have a mediated knowledge. Knowledge. So we have, for instance, to use either. Um, revelation uh, or uh, nature or the angels. Angels are, are, are media in the sense, and McLuhan said uh, media theory is a modern angelology. This is uh, something I always, I always like to remind. Uh, but so this is the big difference between humans and angels. So uh, just to give you, uh, I, I don't want to dismiss your, your critic. Maybe we, it's a really uh, subtle, subtle, subtle question. Uh, we can maybe discuss it starting from this passage, if you don't agree with my reading of, of Thomas. This said, of course, when you speak about la grammatica speculativa, when you, when you uh, talk about the use of the term speculative in the Middle Ages, uh, of course, there is this first meaning, general meaning of speculative as uh, theoretical. So uh, a speculative does is, used, is used in two kinds of oppositions, uh, speculative, practical, so theoretical, practical, and this is the most widespread and the most, so to say, common. And in some authors, such as Thomas, in my opinion, it is used as a, uh, so to say, in order to distinguish between, uh, for instance, intuitive cognition and speculative cognition. That's uh, maybe when, where we do not agree, but then I, we, we can read Thomas together and you, you we can discuss about it. But thank you for, for the remark. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Michaela. And uh, I, I can't hear you. You're muted, Michaela. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, so thank you, Alessandro. It was a, really a great paper and uh, gave me a lot of, lot of ideas too think about. <laughs> I would have a lot of questions, but I will just ask uh, one question. Uh, and I want to go back uh, to uh, one point of our discussion, uh, uh, the debate about my paper and the relation with your paper. So the difference between Richtigkeit uh, and uh, Wahrheit. Um, I totally agree with you that it does not make a lot of sense to ask whether the law of no contradiction is true or false, uh, if by true we mean uh, uh, var. Mm -hmm. mm, but I was wondering if uh, we there is an answer to the question whether the true is richtig or uh, unrichtig, in I guess logic, what would be uh the answer and uh, my intuition is that uh, hegel would uh, if hegel uh, uh hegel, hegel's answers would uh, maybe be that uh, the law on contradiction is richtig and unrichtig and maybe this is not relevant uh, with respect to uh 
speculative thought, but uh, this can say something interesting about the limit of ordinary language uh, and ordinary thought, uh, which is related with, uh, of course, <laughs> which is related with speculative thinking in a negative way, because you, it will be a way to, to, to mark uh, a boundary between the two, ordinary thinking, ordinary thought and speculating, speculative thinking. Uh, but uh, just a comment, and uh, what do you think about uh, the Lono contradiction and the Richtigkeit? Thank you so much. It was great paper. Great paper. Thank you. Thank you, Michela. Um, of course, we should, uh, so to say, uh, discuss what we mean by Richtig. Uh, um, I will, I will. I don't know whether you agree. I will. I will try and use what Hegel, uh, what I uh, what I remember to be uh, uh, Hegel's uh, use of the notion of Richtig. So, for instance, I don't know whether uh, whether you agree, but for instance, uh, for instance, here uh, when we have to something to do with questions such as uh, when was Kaiser born, how many toys were were in a stadium and uh, what did they amount to? So uh, questions, this kind of questions, you can give a, a, a correct answer. So you can, I don't know. So the, for instance, historical proposition are the kind of propositions about which you can just say, you know, it is richtig that uh, Kaiser was Roman. It's unrichtig that Kaiser was Greek. Something, something like that. I don't know whether you agree with this uh, uh, example, okay. Um, from this standpoint, uh, uh, I, 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 I'd say, so the, 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 um, the problem here for me is the relationship between uh, uh, Richtig and uh, uh, Dasein and uh, Existierend, for instance, because uh, the the great um, problem for the, the great topic on which there is a, a, a struggle uh, is, for instance, movement. So Aristotle thought he could describe movement without violating the principle of non-contradiction. So uh, in, in a way, the, the great problem is, according to Aristotle, finite being is not contradictory. According to Hegel, finite being is contradictory. And I do believe that Hegel says that in a, in a, uh, in a very uh, strict way, I mean, everything that is finite is contradictory and, and being contradictory, it is false. That, that, that's, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, textual. I mean, you, you, can, you can read that in Hegel's philosophy. So the problem is, uh, I'd say, that, that, that the question is complex because uh, I'd say, in a way, the law of non-contradiction is unrichtig because it doesn't describe a situation that exists. So if you are, if you are addressing finite being, finite being is contradictory and it is a contradiction that exists. And because it is a finite contradiction that exists, it is, false. It is something that, that's not really, that is, that is in a different way. It is, you know, uh, it, it is not. Hegel says that. It, it is not. The finite is not. Uh, but again, if you want to describe this finite being and you want to, so to say, uh, keep faith to the law of contradiction, according to Hegel, you are uh, you are uh, uh, say reasoning according to the law of the understanding and not according to the law of, uh, of reason. So uh, right now, I, I just said why it is, it's so difficult for me to simply answer, is it richtig or unrichtig? So I'd say it, it is um, unrichtig in, in the way that according to Hegel, there are some aspects of reality that uh, violate the law of non-contradiction. So uh, th th that, that'd be my answer. The, the problem is, of course, 
how then what do you make of it so so to say but uh, uh, yeah that that that's maybe what I what I'd answer in a in a first uh, in in a in a, in a, in a first attempt then just to say also the opposite because it's important to say always to say also the opposite uh, what, what what I find for instance striking in Hegel's um, commentary on Aristotle's formulation of the law of, the law of non-contradiction is precisely that he says, of course, the law of non-contradiction is, is right. I mean, of, of course, a boat is not a stone. So uh, uh, again, you can find both, uh, both occurrences. What I, what I think is important is that, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, there is a, a nice way to put it, uh, something that maybe is, is, is uh, for me is more interesting, namely that if you, um, the, the, the point of view of the understanding is precisely the point of view that there are things that are contradictory and things that are not contradictory, so to say. So for instance, the idea that you only uh, come, you only fall into contradiction when you describe, I don't know, movement, life, the absolute or, or certain kinds of objects, whereas other kinds of objects, for instance, I don't know, static objects do not need the violation of the law of contradiction. For me, the, 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 the negative uh, exer exercise of, the, of speculative thought is precisely to, rec to recognize that everything is contradictory. I mean, if you think about, about it, there is no possible being that is not uh, contradictory. So that's the second part of the answer. But again, thank you. It, it's uh, we have to do, we, have, we have to do something about this richtig uh, var, uh, Let's let's keep it in mind. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, we're almost out of time. Greg, is there anything on the world of um, YouTube? Yeah, thanks for asking. Let me take a look. It looks like there are no questions uh, today or so far. So we'll just keep okay. it going for later. Well, then um, I think probably this is a good place to end for today. It's, uh, it's Nick staying next week. Is that right, Greg? No, it should be me who is. Um... Oh, apologies. Stephen. No, no, no. I need to apologize. Uh, Okay, well, we look forward to Stefan next week. Yeah, Stefan and... is next week, and then the week after that is Nick. Okay, all right, good. Then all right. Uh, Franca, and then Toby. And okay. Our, our final four, our final four. So. All right. Well, we'll look forward to hearing you next week, Stefan. Yeah. And in the meantime, have a good week, folks, um, and stay safe. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Alex. Thanks again. Bye, Alex.